Before we started, we were sitting down uh, in one of the dressing rooms and we were having a conversation about, you know, the communicating science and reason and fixing issues. And one of the things that, that popped up that I thought we might start with, um, the internet seems to have given power to people, which is a good thing, I would say, and power to ideas and the opportunity to share ideas. None of us can become an expert in everything. You just don't have the time or the bandwidth. So how do we deal with the issue of trying to figure out which experts, what criteria should people use to figure out which experts are worth listening to in an age where everyone has been empowered to become their own expert and just become science deniers or, or fact deniers, alternative fact deniers? Richard, you've been at this longer. I'll let you start this. It's a really difficult problem. Uh, in science, we have peer review, that kind of thing. We have methods in place for um, not respecting authority necessarily, but we know that a, 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 an article that's written in a reputable scientific journal has been peer reviewed. We know that the findings will be, uh, if they're important, if they're controversial, they will be replicated, and if they're not repeated, it'll be a matter for suspicion. Um, no scientist has the knowledge to understand all other science. I mean, reading even a journal like Nature or Science, um, I can read the biological papers, some of them. I can't read the physics papers. So you have to rely on authority to some extent. And it's a very difficult problem because we, we pay lip service to the idea that we don't actually uh, um, respect authority just because it is authority, just because it's professor so-and-so, professor has somebody, something who has FRS and so on. Um, so it, it, it is a difficult problem, and when I uh, try to understand physics, I have to, to some extent, obviously, rely on authority. As you say, Matt, the internet raises problems that everybody has a voice. And fortunately, not everybody has quite the same reach as everybody else, but nevertheless, um, it, it is a problem, and we, we get politicians telling us things like, you are the experts now. Well, I'm not an expert on most things, and nor are you, and nor are you. Mm. Um, nobody's an expert on, on, on everything. And so it, it is a, a difficult stage we're in where people are being treated as though all opinions are equally valid. Yeah, it actually strikes me as a fairly subtle and difficult to communicate point that in science and in intellectual life generally, we don't rely on authority except we do up until the moment we repudiate authority. I mean, you, you have to be competent to the conversation in order to completely subvert the, the, the status quo. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, all, it's true that science advances by discovering that the authorities were wrong, at least on, you know, important marginal points, and, and sometimes just wrong wholesale. But it's... It, just as Richard says, I mean, it's impossible to, to have the totality of human knowledge uh, self-authenticated. And the only reason why we're confident that anything is the way it is, is because we are content to rely on authorities most of the time. And, 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 and the reason why that, that faith, to use a loaded word, is, is valid is because these authorities are functioning in, in a culture that is, in, in the best case, uh, and science really is the best case here, continually purifying itself of error. And it's, it's, it's not being driven by ideology, and it's not being channeled by accidents of birth. You don't have a, a Japanese science and an American science and with nationalism getting in the way. And, and so, so there's, there's, a, there's a process that, that we rely on. And, and both things are true. We rely on authority and, and, and we don't. So I, I'm fond of pointing out that, you know, I don't have faith. I, don't, I won't use the word to describe this because I think what I have is uh, a, a confidence level, a trust that is, to, to borrow from Hume, proportional to the evidence that supports it. And there are people who would just say, well, you're just, you're, you're not only are you picking and choosing your experts, but you might be picking and choosing the evidence you want. Is it the case that, as, as, as science is the single most consistently reliable tool that we have for discovering things about reality, but we've taught people about 
the scientific method, which is an inaccurate way of looking at it because there are multiple methods. And we realize that the way we get to new information is by challenging and overthrowing the existing information. And so you get the people who are like, oh, you laugh at me now, but they laughed at Newton or they laughed at, you know. Mm -hmm. have, we, have we constructed um, a system inadvertently where we're going to be constantly fighting this battle and it's just amplified by our current access to massive amounts of, of opinions and information? Well, it's amplified and also the, the capacity to detect error is also amplified. I mean, I, I, this is just the, the dual effect of the internet, which you know, half of which is perverse. That is, if, if you want to remain a slave to confirmation bias, you can forever, apparently, on the internet. But if you, if you actually want to discover if you're mistaken, you can also do that pretty quickly. So there's also what we see in social media, which all of us make use of it, that the algorithms that you see on Facebook and stuff basically feed you more of what you've already liked. Mm -hmm. And so we're creating bubbles. And there's mountains of concern in this room and everywhere else about the sorts of bubbles that we're creating. And how do we start? I mean, obviously, we're not going to go. Maybe we can go to Mark Zuckerberg. Could you, maybe Richard could go to Mark and say, hey, let's change these algorithms. I think it, this is an interesting point because in, in our wild ancestry, in our primitive state, we lived in a village, 150 or so people, and um, we, we met the people we, we, we knew, and opinion was just shared within this group of 150 people. And now that's broadened out to the whole world, except that in a way it isn't, because as you say, we live in bubbles, and so we each live in our village, but our village is now distributed spatially, geographically, uh, and it's no longer uh, enclosed within, within the village walls. It's, it's, um, it's got a, it's a kind of virtual village, which is, which is interesting. And it's a real discipline we have to, we have to try shake off the bubble mentality, the village mentality, and reach out to, to um, other circles that we wouldn't normally encounter. And the degree to which we're in bubbles, uh, I mean, I've never appreciated as much as since the 2016 election. And this is a point I've made on my podcast a few times, but it just, it, it, I, I find it continually astounding, so I'll, I'll make it again. I realized, I, I had heard that smoking cigarettes, in the States at least, it might still, it might be true in the UK as well, but smoking cigarettes in the States correlates with many different variables. Uh, and also uh, the communities of, of people who smoke and don't smoke tend to, to be quite separable. And I realized that with a shock that Hitch was the last person I knew on earth who smoked. <laughs> uh, which, I mean, which is a measure of just incredible isolation socially. Uh, and it's done, I've done very little to remedy it, I must say. Uh, but it's, um, it, you know, who knows what else, I mean, in fact, we know a little bit about what else segregates with that uh, isolation. And my complete bewilderment that we have uh, President Trump is a symptom of, of that isolation, I think. I, it amuses me because as a former smoker, mm -hmm. uh, I know that you're constantly being shoved outside. So you end up outside with a group of other people who are already pissed off that they're having to go outside to smoke. Mm -hmm. So now they're in this angry headspace and then they begin to share and connect. So maybe smoking doesn't just kill, but smoking creates insular communities that are sharing their anger and vitriol mm -hmm. outside the door. Yeah, they're all weighing along the, along the platform, um, along the pavement, outside all the shops and all the places, all these, there's a sort of long ribbon of s the smoking community, this haze of blue smoke. Um, just to be clear, we're not blaming all the world's problems on smokers or <laughs> Trump uh, on, on smokers. But that, this issue that we're, we're kind of dancing around with, we've kind of moved on to something that, I know that each of us, repeatedly deals with concepts around free speech and who, is, who should be allowed to talk, not just who should we listen to as an expert, but uh, what kind of things should go on at our universities. Uh, clearly, the free speech laws that I'm used to in the United States are different uh, than, than they are here to some extent. I, and, I, and I don't know because I'm not an expert, uh, but there are places that are outlawing offense the causing of offense as if, not just in the sense of blasphemy, but you know, serious offense. 
That bothers me almost as much, if not more, than what we're seeing happening in our halls of higher learning. Where do you think we are? How did we get here, and what needs to be done to fix it? You're welcome for the fix the entire problem at once question. Well, it, it, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about this in the UK, where you don't have a Bill of Rights. Uh, so we're actually we're in very different situations, or, or importantly different situations in the U.S. and the U.K. And your libel laws are, are the inverse of ours. I feel like in the, in the U.S. we have a, a, a slightly better balance, as frustrating as it is to uh, contemplate suing people for slander and then realizing there's absolutely no way to do that. Whereas here you can you can sue and, well, and yes, the burden is on I, them I to defend themselves. My cost is, um, Yes, I, I find, for me, the issue is not so much about free speech as freedom to listen. And when uh, people are um, denied access to, when, when they're deplatformed, as I have been. Have you been deplatformed? No, so, no. no. Um, it's quite fact, an honor. What's, quite, what's, yeah. what's strange is, uh, and this is, you'd think we would have similar experiences here, I've actually never had a heckler. I've only had one, yeah, I So, so don't, don't, don't be the first. <laughs> That doesn't count. Yes. I, I've, I've, I've only had one. That was in Oklahoma. Somebody who said, you have you've insulted my savior. And uh, I'm sure you have. I was quite keen to engage with him, actually. But unfortunately, the security people dragged him out. But yeah. I, I was, I, I was deplatformed in Berkeley, California. And this hurt me because this, these were, as I thought, my own people. This was KPFA, which is a ultra-liberal radio station in Berkeley, California. When I lived, I lived there for two years, and I love KPFA. I used to be a subscriber. They're subscriber only, mm -hmm. and I, I subscribed to them. And so I felt uh, hurt by that. I didn't think it was a free speech issue, actually. I mean, they're entitled to, it's a radio station. They don't have to have me on. But I did feel it was a freedom to listen. And uh, people had paid to come to an event which I was billed to speak at. And I thought this comes up again and again in universities. And, and I, I do feel that you know, Berkeley, of all places where the free speech movement started, universities of all places are places where students ought to be exposed to opinions that they disagree with, opinions that they find distasteful or hurtful. And I think it's a betrayal of everything that a university stands for, that people are being deplatformed by students mm. uh, yeah. and prevented from, um, and, and other students are, are prevented from hearing um, what, yeah. what they want to hear. And I'm actually very glad that you made that point. So one of the things that happens is uh, we announce an event like this, and somebody's like, oh, there's massive disagreements between these. How did they get on the same stage and blah, blah, blah. There were people who would have been, would have been convinced that you and I had a difference of opinion on this deplatforming thing. And in reality, I think we're almost side by side, because my view is a university gets to invite whatever speaker they want. They can disinvite whatever speaker they want. People can go or not go. They can protest or not protest as long as they're doing it peacefully. Uh, it's when they dishonestly go about trying to deplatform somebody. So it's the method that they're using to shut someone down is what I object to more than people exercising their right to listen or, or, or attend an event. And in many cases, we've seen um, the, the people who run the venue have no idea about the nuances and whatever bickering has been going on in the community around this. And they'll get a message from somebody, it happened at a, an event I was at yesterday, oh, you're putting this group, women in danger, by having this speaker here. And as the owners of a venue who have to listen and have to have insurance, this is a tactic that works to get speakers removed when it actually has nothing to do with the content of what they're saying or a fair representation of the conversation that might have been. Yes. I mean, that is exactly what happened in the, in the, in the Berkeley case. That they, they, they were phoned up by, I think, one individual, and, and, they, and they just acted on that. They, you, as you say, they, they feel they have to act. Mm. 
Well, the problem is it does work, uh, and especially when there are security concerns involved. There, uh, you know, I'm in touch with this group, the ex-Muslims of North America, which has been, you know, for reasons easy to parse from the title, uh, have security concerns. And when they try to book an event at a university, they're now finding their events canceled the moment people figure out, you know, who they are. And, and but it, it, it is the it, you know, they have the legal right to free speech. There's no, you know, there's no law against criticizing Islam, but people have just discovered that it's so inconvenient to incur these security concerns that it, you, you have a de facto loss of that freedom. It, it makes me wonder about, uh, this actually came up in a couple of discussions. I had Mohammed Syed on, on the show mm -hmm. recently, and yesterday I moderated a debate between uh, Faisal and Azra Namani. Um, we, there's a lot of different perceptions about what Islam is and what Islam isn't. If I'd have said that faster, it would have been a good tongue twister. Mm. You, you would think that if we exercised our moral outrage against problems fairly, that it would not be the ex-Muslims, the ones who are trying to point out the problems, who end up deplatformed. That there would be enough I, I realize I'm being a little idealistic and, and, and wide-eyed that there would be enough uh, genuine concern about humanity that we could have conversations on important topics and not be sidelining the people who are actively trying to work to fix the issue because not every ex-Muslim is, is, you know, reactionary. Some of them are reformers or attempting to. Mm. Well, of course. Um, there was a terrible episode in London School of Economics when Mariam Namazi, who is, I suppose, the leading ex-Muslim exponent in this country, uh, was make, having, giving, giving a speech, and she was barracked and heckled, and more or less the thing was closed down by a group of Muslims who came and, um, I think, tore out her microphone, tore out her PowerPoint so she couldn't speak, um, and she courageously soldiered on. But what was truly distressing about that was that the feminist society of LSE came out in favor of these Muslims. Feminism, all people who, should, who you would think would be disgusted by the sorts of way uh, it, women are treated uh, by Islamists. Uh, that, that, I think, was what was truly awful about that episode of, uh, um, at LSE. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a point that people don't tend to notice, but the, the ex-Muslims are actually the most vulnerable and beleaguered community because apostasy, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is thought to be punishable by death under Islam, certainly most interpretations of it. And uh, so here you have a community that is threatened by their, the religious community they've attempted to leave, and many of these people are in the closet, they can't use their real names, and yet this is precisely the, the community that is attacked as Uncle Toms or racists or, or you know, colonious shills by so-called liberal non-Muslims. So it's, they get it from both sides, and they have, they have virtually no sanctuary but the, the secular community. This came up yesterday, and because I mentioned reformers, I thought maybe I would toss it out there. You may or may not have a strong view on this. Is there value in encouraging reform of Islam and, and particularly extremist varieties of Islam? Um, or is that like trying to reform young earth creationists so that we end up with old earth creationists or day age creationists? Is it, is it a better tactic to just continue to demand evidence for bad ideas and expose them? Or, or are we willing to accept a softer, gentler version of Islam? Well, I think, it, I think we can move on both tracks at once. I mean, so my, uh, my friend and collaborator Majid Nawaz is very much on the reform side, and his answer to this is, if you think uh, reform is hard, just imagine trying to get 1.6 billion Muslims to apostatize, which is really the, the alternative. Uh, but obviously some people will apostatize when they're convinced that there is no God or no book could have been revealed by him. Uh, so uh, I think, you, I think you, you can make the argument uh, both ways and, and simultaneously. Yes, I mean, the same argument comes up in the uh, cre creationism de debate. Should we, should we 
ally ourselves with relatively sensible Christians who, who actually accept evolution and or, or should we say should we say the whole of religion is bunk um, and I mean I, I have c collaborated with bishops in opposing cre in, in opposing creationism but on the other hand I get what Matt is saying if you if you, if you encourage the sort of soft um, wishy-washy Christian who actually accepts evolution but thinks somehow God had something to do with it somewhere along the line. Um, maybe that's more damaging and it's better to come out with all guns blazing against religion altogether. And I've done it both ways and I can't decide uh, which is the best. <laughs> the, uh, the Reverend Barry Lynn is, is the current or former president of Americans United for Church-State Separation and we shared a, state at a, a stage at a Secular Student Alliance event um, and I, I like him and we get along and he's working on behalf of church state separation so it's great but we disagree vehemently on whether or not there's a God and, and so I told him uh, that I have a goal of changing the entire world I'd like to get rid of bad ideas including religious ideas wherever I find them uh, but I told him that his soul was safe from me because I want him as the theist supporting church state separation that I can point to so his will be the last soul that I try to debunk so that we can continue to work together towards a good goal. So if, if it's the case that we can work down multiple tracks, one of the, the things that came up is, do you, I, I talked about intractable minds, the, the ones that may not change. The thing is, I can't tell the difference. If there's two people standing in front of me and one of them truly has a mind that will not be moved and the other one um, could be changed, I can't, tell which one's which, and I'm not necessarily sure that that's true that neither of them can change their mind. So I go with this assumption that their mind can be changed even if it's not by me or not right now. Mm. Uh, and if there's somebody who I can't affect, my goal becomes to try to change the world around them by dealing with the minds that can be changed. In, for, for both of you, when you, you've both had conversations with people who could best be described as brick walls. That, that you might as well have had the conversation on your own rather than to engage with it. What do you take away from that? How do you, is it, does it get discouraging? How do you battle the frustration of the perceived futility in the moment against the, the clear advances that we might be making? Unfortunately, Dan Dennett is one of my brick walls on the topic of free will, uh, and I'm, I'm his. Um, well, I think the, the one thing to notice is that, as you say, it's not always about changing someone's mind in the moment. I mean, people tend to like to change their minds in private, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, there's a kind of a, a faith-saving aspect to this, and there's just, you know, a kind of the water on the rock process where you might not be the, the, the final moment that changes their mind, but you're part of a process. Uh, so you, I'm, I'm always impressed, and I think we've talked about this as well, how few experience I, experiences I have where it's, it's clear that someone came into a conversation with a very strongly held opinion, and by some process of reasoning, they, at the end of the conversation, totally disavow it. I, mean, this is, I, can, uh, I think I can count on one hand <laughs> it's, it's the number of times I've seen that happen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, know, you and I are, are just inundated with the testimony of people who have changed their minds yeah. on these core issues yeah. through some process, and then the process all, often entails reading books or hearing debates. Or I mean, so it's not it's it's like watching a you know seeing a supernova go off or something. I mean they're going off all the time, but we're not we're not seeing them. A few years ago, there was a, a talk at one of the atheist conferences by a man whose his talk was called "Don't Be a Dick," <laughs> and. Um, he, 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 pr he produced what he thought was an absolute slam dunk argument. He said, how many of you in the audience, if somebody called you an idiot, would change your mind? And of course, nobody would. But I've, I felt that was a very unfair tactic because if I, if, if, if I tell somebody he's, a, he's an idiot, and I don't do quite those words, but if, but if, if, if it, the effect of what I'm saying is that he is, a, is an idiot, I admit I'm not going to change his mind but if there are a lot of other people listening in, say it's a radio audience, I mean, I've, you've probably done, um, I know you've done um, 
things where you're talking to one, one person who probably is an idiot, and yet you know that there are, that there are hundreds, thousands of people in the radio audience lis listening in. Yep. You haven't changed the mind of the idiot, but you've probably changed the minds of all the other people who are listening yeah. at the same time. And so this... this is <laughs> it's, per it's precisely the situation that, that I deal with both on the atheist experience and off. I'm not necessarily trying to change the caller's mind, although I'm happy for that to happen. I'm having the conversation for all the people out there who agree, who would have used those same arguments. Because we know that on some occasions, if you can be shown to be wrong, people will sometimes double down, especially if they've made a public profession mm -hmm. on behalf of something. This just becomes flat denial. But we also know that through, I don't, I don't want to go down the mirror neuron route because you'll probably correct me, uh, but at least with respect to empathy, if you see someone presenting your arguments and they are uh, humiliating themselves, not just, you know, I'm not necessarily humiliating, they're humiliating themselves, this affects that individual who's watching in a way almost as if it had happened to them, and that they, yet they have the safety of not having been on public hum yeah. humiliated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I might be wired differently here, but I, I have a different reaction to being called an idiot. If there's a, I don't think uh, you're ever called an idiot. So. Well, no, no, I mean, well, <laughs> virtually so. Uh, no, I'm, uh, well, if the per, if, I guess the source is relevant, but if, if the source is someone who you find credible on other topics, and that source tells you you're wrong on topic X, uh, that becomes very interesting to me. You know, if, if Steve Pinker calls me an idiot, I'm very interested. And so, and, and, and the offense really has nothing to do with it at that point. So it is, I guess it's more of a sourcing issue because, you know, the, the people who tend to call you an idiot are usually disconfirm their, their authority. When, when, I was, when I was an undergraduate, I, I, was, I read The Phenomenon of Man by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and I was completely taken in by it. I thought it was wonderful. Mm. Uh, and then um, I read Peter Medawar's review of yeah. this book. Recommend, it's the, the finest negative book review ever written. Um, <laughs> read it. Um, and I finished this review and I said, I'm an idiot. I was, yeah. I was completely that's, fooled by... by that review. moment of awakening, I've talked before, it's not so much being wrong that affects people, because you think you're right. So it's, you know, it's not like anything to feel that you're wrong. It's the discovery that you're wrong that is sort of the testament of your character. Because for me, finding out that I was wrong is, 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 is joyous, not that I was wrong, but that I don't have to continue being wrong, mm, yeah. that, that I've made this actual discovery. And there are you know, people who will write in and will say, oh, Matt's wonderful on religion, but terrible on topic X. And without too much exaggeration, I could probably pull up 100 emails and all of them disagree on what X is. Matt's right about everything except X. I want to get all of them together in a room so they can argue with each other because the, every one of those X's is covered by somebody else. You might be wrong about everything. I, I am. That's because compatible with the data. At, le at least I can't show that I'm not. Uh, I, well, it's, it's interesting psychologically that, that I mean, we all have this experience of being proven wrong and that's interesting, but I'm more interested in what we do with this sneaking feeling that we might be wrong. I mean, that's the psychologically and culturally, that's, that is a, a far more well-subscribed state of mind. And it's, I think, very consequential. Uh, because well, obviously when you're, you're unequivocally wrong, well then, you know, I guess some people manage to ignore this, but uh, it's, that's, there's not a lot to, to I think I just lost. Oh, there we are. There we go. Um, but most of us, most of the time, live with opinions that are not so well vetted. You know, and and it's, I think it's good to be skeptical of, of thoughts that come out of your mouth or, or hit the page or you find yourself affirming, which... which uh, you know, if, if suddenly a, a very smart expert in the relevant area stood before you and said, well, have you really thought that through? You know, if you break out into a cold sweat at that point, it, it's worth sort of calibrating your, your yeah. conviction on those points, I think. 
I, uh, I think there's a phrase that I've heard over and over that feeds right into that exact moment. Because theists' arguments, or at least the ones that I deal with on the show frequently, there's almost a script. And my job or my goal most of the time is to get them off the script because I care more about getting them to think about it rather than parroting what they heard from some apologist. And when you start getting them off the script, seems to me the most common reaction to that, which may be them mulling over the possibility that they could be wrong, is to just say, oh, that was a trick question. There's a, there's a defense mechanism there, as if there's, I don't, and I'm not even sure what a trick question is. I asked you, you know, okay, please explain what you believe and why. What was tricky about that? And yet this seems to be perhaps a defense mechanism that creeps in at those times. If we, I don't know how many others, uh, how many more defense mechanisms, mechanisms like that we might find, uh, but I'm constantly looking for ways to combat them, constantly looking for ways to have a better discussion. Doesn't mean I'm going to have a good discussion with every single person, but if we see these same trends over and over, how, how do we, maybe there's no answer, but shouldn't we try to identify those trends in the actual thought processes and attack those perhaps more than the facts surrounding the, the underlying belief. Yeah, it is more about process than about facts, because the facts change and your, I mean, there's, there's always new ones coming in, and so it's, it's the process by which you are vetting your opinions that I think is, is crucial, and I think it's, it's useful to ask yourself and it's useful to ask someone you're arguing with what would have to be true of the world for you to admit that you're wrong? Yeah. Like, like what would, how, in what sense is your view on this topic falsifiable? Uh, and often there's no answer to that. You know, often that there's, often there was, in, especially in the case of religion, you, you'll get people who actually sign on this dotted line, they'll say, you know, the, the, there's absolutely nothing in the world of my experience that could change that would falsify my belief in Jesus say, and if, and if that's true, well then that's proof positive that it's actually not based on any engagement with, with the, the world of your experience. Although what I'll hear sometimes, the people who will do that have true and unfalsifiable position, but they'll go then to personal experience. For example, Ray Comfort will tell you there's no way you could prove to him that Jesus doesn't exist because he's as real to Ray as his wife. And even when I tried to point out, you can introduce me to your wife and I can you know, meet her and talk to her, right? You can't do that. It doesn't phase. And when I, not to continually use my mother as an example, sorry, mom, not that she'll ever freaking see this, but she, she will say, uh, she doesn't care about the Bible. She doesn't, or well, she, I mean, she does, but she doesn't care if you can point out problems with it. Doesn't care about philosophical arguments. Doesn't care about the logical arguments. She sees Jesus working in her life every day. And even if I were to try to go down the route of, I'm willing to accept that you have experiences that you are claiming and attributing to Jesus. I, I just wonder what the justification is for that. That has no impact on her. It may be me, that I, I should never have these conversations with my mom. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's the path that it often goes down when, when they start seeing this, this doubt mechanism coming in of, oh, no, no, it couldn't be true because of this, of this experience that I have. As skeptics, as critical thinkers, I, I would, I don't know, in much the same way that I, I talked about perhaps not addressing the facts as much as the mechanisms, I think there's a, a value for a campaign to teach people to stop being so confident about their interpretation of their personal experiences. Because all of those seem to be an argument from ignorance. I, I experienced this, I have no explanation for it, therefore it must be God, or therefore it's a ghost, or therefore this pill worked, or this whatever worked. Cool. Yeah, well, uh, that, 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 yeah. And I, I, I think, I, I have to confess that if I'm asked what it would take to falsify my non-belief in God, or what it would take to convince me of anything supernatural, I find it very hard. I used to think it'd be easy. You just, you just, you know, God would appear in clouds and, and, and chariots of fire and things. Well, that's a start, but, isn't it? I used, I used to think that, but, but I, I mean, I've seen so many good conjuring tricks, and, and, and uh, 
where, where, where you absolutely swear blind it's supernatural. Mm. Um, and yet we, we know it's a trick. Um, I suppose if, if, if Jesus came down in a chariot from a cloud, that would do it for me. But um, <laughs> I, 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 want, I want that piece of video excerpted and put on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I still think, actually, a more plausible explanation than anything supernatural is natural we don't yet understand. And so a, 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 a trick wrought by an alien civilization that we don't know about yet or something is actually as implausible as it is. It is more plausible than the laws of physics have been violated, which is what we're kind of talking about when we talk about. Yeah, this, this issue, is, you and I uh, discussed this in Vancouver and Lawrence Krauss and I did as well, because quite often people will say, ah, well, what would it take to change your mind about whether or not there's a God? And I, I, I used to give fairly glib answers of Jesus coming down from the clouds and whatever, and I realized that what you were just talking about, so my answer changed. I have no idea what would convince me that a God exists, but if there's a God, he should absolutely know what should convince me. Yeah. And he hasn't done that, which means he either doesn't exist or doesn't want me to know he exists. Either way, it's not my problem. Yeah. I, I want to, we're, we're going to keep talking. I want to give people the opportunity to, to start. Don't make a mad rush, but you can start lining up for questions at us. But I, I had some for Richard that we both kind of talked about earlier because it came in. Um, Sam had tweeted out, hey, what, what do you want us to talk about? And one of them that came in, which I have virtually no input or, or thoughts on, is the future of human evolution, what we might see in the future. Um, both that, from a I guarantee that will come up from the audience. It always I, I, does. I, I'm, pre I'm preempting it so that those people don't have to walk up to the microphone and we can talk about that in the interim. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're talking about uh, a real major evolutionary change comparable to, say, the increase in size of the human brain that's happened over the last three million years. Uh, if you look three million years into, into the future, would you expect the brain to sort of balloon out like the Mekon? Um, and the answer is yes, only if the selection pressure in favor of braininess is maintained. There must have been, uh, during the past three million years since Australopithecus, um, there must have been a selection pressure such that the brainiest individuals survived better and had the most children. Is it the case in our world today that the brainiest individuals... <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Enough on that. Um, I suppose you could, you could imagine that if we colonize distant planets, uh, maybe even Mars, such that there's very little gene flow between the home planet and the colony living in greenhouses in, on Mars, that you might expect to get some interesting evolutionary change due to the reduced gravitational field, more spindly legs, um, mm. a, a more sort of spider-like form of the human body rather than the rhinoceros-like form that you would get if you were colonizing a planet with a very much stronger gravitational field. Um, but the trouble is really that in our world today, uh, reproductive success is so, or survival indeed, is so much cushioned by the civilized conditions under which we live that it's almost impossible to say that there will be a consistent selection pressure in any particular direction. Um, I've, I've sometimes jokingly, on the many, many occasions when I've been asked this question, um, I've sometimes jokingly suggested that uh, a, a large number of people are probably born because their parents were incompetent at the use of contraceptives. Yeah. <laughs> That's the wrong selection pressure. And therefore, it, it, therefore if, if this in, incompetence sort of fumbling with, with, with the... With You, you might expect future generations to be more and more incompetent in this. We'll, we'll forget how to make latex entirely. That, 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 that kind of thing. But, to, but I mean, but that, that's really an absurd example to, to illustrate the, the point that since we live in conditions when 
well, in particular case, what it takes to be incompetent is going to change by the, by the decade, let alone by the, by the millennium, let alone by the million years. So in a million years' time, uh, conditions will be so different because of civilization. Conditions will be so different if we're still around at all, which is a moot point, um, that, that it's unlikely that any selection pressure that's going on now will sure. still be recognizable then. And so, and so I would not even begin to make a forecast as to what's going to happen. So let me throw on my quasi-creationist beanie. And instead of speculating about perhaps features or what might happen, uh, because they try to make a distinction between species and kind, whatever, uh, what time frame, let's say we, we, we colonize Mars and now there's no more interbreeding, what kind of time scale are we looking at to where we might be seen as completely different species, independent? That means the time scale until the point where we can no longer interbreed. Yes. Um, well, it, it, it could be as, as quick as 10,000 years, I suppose. What's the time scale for no longer wanting to interbreed? <laughs> Surely, it's that's a, measured in beer. Yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, no. That did, we, isn't it, it, it's the opposite problem. lesson based yeah, on yeah. what the, we we yeah. apparently did with the Neanderthals, or they did with us? Yes. Well, yeah. we 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 now know that we did interbreed with them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Richard, just to follow on that, what are your thoughts about the the artificial evolution of of engineering our genomes to be? That's also different. guaranteed to come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, but, but I, I, <laughs> um, we might as well do it here. Yeah, I, I don't have any great. I mean, it's, it's, it's. I think it's both an exciting and a, and a frightening possibility. Um, if, you, uh, if you had to guess the, the, about the time course of this, well, what do you, what, when do you think it will? I, I t really tell you one thing. Common? I mean, we, we've been manipulating evolution in agricultural animals and plants for thousands of years. And we've produced dramatic changes in cabbages, in dogs, in cows, in pigs. Um, I mean, when you think that a Pekingese is a wolf, uh, and, and we've been doing that by, by the selection part of the Darwinian equation. Um, we're now talking about the mutation part of the Darwinian equation, about actually manipulating the genes. Um, we have, during all those thousands of years, we have never changed humans in the way that we've changed dogs and cabbages and, and, and horses. Um, so in a way, you might say, well, since we haven't done it by the easy way, which is selection, why would we suddenly imagine that we might start doing it by the hard way, which is genetic manipulation? Maybe we will. You don't think the hard way is going to become the easy way fairly quickly? It could be. Yeah, it could be. Are, are you, is there an implication there that there are certain genetic pathways that are more amenable to change uh, that maybe how rigid of a path uh, have humans become? What, what are we just assuming that we can manipulate things and implement changes? Maybe we're in a rigid structure where we can't, couldn't possibly do the same thing that we do with dogs. No, I mean, I think, I think it, 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 as Sam says, I, I think it, w it will become easier. And, um, then, then society is going to have to decide what, what to, to do about that. Mm. So on that note, I, I'm going to have them bring the house lights up so that we can see the people who are waiting for questions. And uh, just for clarity, I'm the asshole. By that, uh, I think we're all aware that questions in, in a question mark and don't begin with your life story or your, or your dissertation or anything like that. Um, and to spare either of them any public embarrassment. If you've gone on too long, I can go back to Austin and London can hate me if I cut somebody off a little too quickly. Uh, but we, we want to take questions and just remember there's a lot of people lined up. I, I think we'll, if we can get the house lights up, we'll start over here off to my right. And, and by the way, sorry, I'm good at interrupting. I do it on this show all the time. Uh, you can say your name if you want to, but if you have a question specifically for one of us, please say so, because we're going to avoid all three of us answering everything so that we go on all night. Right. And could right. we please have the house lights up? 
Yeah, I, I just want to say that I'm really thankful that you had already addressed the question of what would change your mind, because I had a dilemma which question to ask coming in. Um, I consider myself agnostic, and my question is uh, regarding the future of agnosticism and atheism and this whole difference. I myself, however, have never read the Bible, nor the Quran, nor any other religious text that uh, says, uh, claims a lot of, uh, has very scientific, unscientific claims in it. But I, I also know a lot of religious people who believe all these crazy claims, who have never read the texts. So my question is, does one really need to have read those texts uh, to be in one or the other category? And what do you think will happen in the future when we have virtual reality and crazy entertainment which would make people less likely to read the, the books that sounds like what was 100 or 1,000 years ago? Okay, that, that's two questions that may not necessarily be in the same. Who, who wants this? Well, well, do, just, do you need to read the holy yeah, books? No, I mean, clearly people are getting their religious worldview from more than just the books, and there are, as you say, there are people who might even be fundamentalist in their religion who are, are pretty unschooled in what it's actually in the text because they're getting it in church or, or synagogue or mosque. Uh, I think it's in the U.S., uh, you might know this better than I do, but it's something like 50% of the population can't say who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that's impressive in a country where 83% are sure that Jesus rose from the dead and will be coming back to earth. So uh, there's, a, there's a mismatch there. But I, I think it's, it, it's useful to read the books because it's not, so much, what's, it's not so, so much all the bad things that are in the books, from my point of view. It's all the good things that aren't in the books that an omniscient being definitely would have put in there. I mean, that's, that's the deal breaker as far as uh, the, 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 the credence given to the claims of, of revelation. It would be so easy to write a better book than any of these books, especially if you were omniscient. And there's just, there's nothing in there that demands uh, an omniscient God as, as author. Yes, I, I was going to say um, the, 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 the best cure for religion would be to read the holy books. But, but, um, but Sam kind of preempted that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to, and to, um, and, ju and, ju and just to, to cap the, the, the story about the Sermon on the, on the Mount, uh, my British foundation, British, uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, did a survey uh, of, in 2011, immediately after the census, the week after the census, we took just the people who ticked the Christian box in the what is your religion. So these are people who self-identify as Christian. And, among the, and we gave a... An, an opinion poll for these people, and among the questions was, can you name the first book of the New Testament? And we only gave a choice of four, Matthew, Acts, Genesis, and Psalms. And I think only uh, somewhere in around 30%, I think was 39% of the people who ticked the Christian box were able to identify Matthew as the f first book of the New mm -hmm. Testament. Um, so they don't read the Bible, and I think it actually would be rather a good idea if, if they did. Hey, so, so first of all, thank you. Um, my question's for Sam. I, uh, I voted leave in the Brexit referendum. <laughs> given... <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> But given your uh, friendship with both Richard and um, Douglas Murray, hmm. if you'd had the vote, which way would you have voted? Uh, I guess I, I get, well, does that, my brain has to segment in two there. Um, I, I really have to plead ignorance here. I, I, I have a- Exactly, uh, on, exactly. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> If you so, had to, if can, you had to. Can I ask the, 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 the questioner, do you have a degree in economics? Uh, no, I don't, but I, no. but I trust people like Douglas Murray, who I think is a genius. So I yeah, well, I, I, I am an immense fan of Douglas's, and, and he may even be here tonight. Um, I, um, I, I have to plead ignorance on this point. I really don't, I'm not, I don't consider myself informed enough to know 
what the likely consequences were at the time of the vote, I mean, what, what a, a truly intelligent person and well-informed person would have thought at the time of the vote, but um, nor do I know where it's all going. But I, I have a bias, which is that an integration of our world is, a, is a, a, generally speaking, a good thing. Uh, and a, a, a populist backlash against integration is a sign of, of good things not happening. Uh, and, the, and so we, we, when you think about the, the solutions, the likely solutions to, to problems that exist at a global scale, I think those are, are almost certainly, this is almost a tautology, those are almost like, uh, guaranteed to be global solutions. And if we can't, if we can't integrate enough to, to actually execute on global solutions in a, in a timely way, that, that's going to be a disaster for us. So I think my bias is definitely toward, toward integration. And so, I, I, again, I, don't, I can't say that I know Brexit is the, the death knell of civilization. But, um, <laughs> you know, just if I had to toss a coin, I, I would, it would probably come up on the side of, of uh, being, being worried by, by that trend. So. Thank you very much. Mangala metaphor. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Andre. Thank you very much for being here, Sam. I'm a, I'm a big fan. A uh, question for you, for, Osman, for Sam. Um, we are nine months in from Trump presidency. Don't you miss the days when the biggest issue was creationism, not so much tribalism, social justice, and so on? And what should it be if the next presidency would be Hillary Clinton? Uh, to do in order to change those voters, that those voters should not vote for Trump again. What should that president do for those voters? Did, did you just suggest that the next president might be Hillary Clinton? No, <laughs> like, uh, like the Democratic Party, I mean. Oh, um, what, do the, what do the Democrats need to do to yeah. avoid Yeah, there, there, there are a few things more impossible than that the, the Hillary Clinton might be president. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question enough to, to satisfy you. I, I, I think I, we, we need to, clearly, we have a problem on the left. I mean, there's a, kind of, there's a, there's a tendency for, toward a, a swing into what's now being described as a, a kind of authoritarian left uh, in liberal circles. Uh, and an intolerance of free speech is, is, is the most salient symptom there on, on college campuses. Uh, and that. It, definitely worries me because it's, that's precisely what is not going to give us an answer to, to populism and authoritarianism, authoritarianism on the right. Uh, it's not, you know, Trump, uh, Trump wins, uh, has every advantage in his response to that kind of irrationality on the left. So if you want to, to amplify Trump's power, uh, and you want to, to give further voice to the, to the most odious people who celebrate his power, what you should do on the left is become absolutely focused on identity politics and uh, this, this species of, of leftist unreason we're seeing. So I, I think we, we need something that at one point I called the new center. Uh, the, the, this, this phrase has, uh, has exactly no traction. but. <laughs> It's not an accident that the right answer to many questions and the right, the right answer to just how you have a rational political process of compromise is rarely at the extremes politically. And, and so I think we have to find something that is animating about, about not being an ideologue on the left or the right. Uh, if I may interject, just a, a second question for uh, Richard, please. Well, you, well we should probably oh, go one at a time, to yeah. be fair. And, and actually, it, it, to spin off of something that Sam said, and I don't know that this is a significant point of disagreement, um, I'm definitely on the left. I don't think that'll surprise anybody. However, I've also been in, attacked by people on the left. And among some of my friends who raise legitimate criticisms about the manner in which some people on the left are engaging or encouraging disengagement, they move to a new center, or let's define this, I don't do that. Um, I stay on the left, I'm clearly on the left, and then I point out all the crap that's wrong on the left. I spend as much time probably uh, addressing irrationality and, and dishonest argument 
from the left as I ever would on the right, and the same thing applies with regard to religion. Uh, dealing with theistic arguments after 13 and a half years of doing the show, it's trivial. It, it, it's almost boring if I didn't make a game out of it, which we can talk about another time. But I find myself engaging with other atheists, other skeptics, other secularists, because I hate bad arguments, but I hate them most when they're coming from the people who are ostensibly part of my group or yeah. agree with me on the issue. I don't want lack of belief in God to be so poorly argued for that we're providing ammunition to the opposition. And I can be opposed to fascists and opposed to Antifa and not think they're the exact same thing, or just like I can be opposed to cancer and athlete's foot and, and not. But, but the thing is, if, if the people with the truly bad ideas that are terrible for the world, objectively terrible for the world, are working within the bounds of the law and are less likely to cross boundaries of reason than those in opposition are, who are engaged in hyperbole and zero nuance. And if you are not absolutely in agreement with me, you are the end of the world. I've been called a Nazi sympathizer just for suggesting that maybe I shouldn't run around and punching people that I disagree with. That was enough. So, but I'd rather stay on the left than point out the problems on the left rather than trying to create a new center, which I would still think would be defined as like old left. That new center is old left. Yeah. Hi there. Um, first, I just want to say thank you, um, Richard and Sam. Your books and your videos have been talked about enough flat for years. Um, I had to write an essay on something which society um, considers taboo or disgusting, anything I wanted to kind of write about, and I had to try and justify it. And what I was kind of came up with is um, the topic of incest. Society thinks it's disgusting, it's weird, it's odd. Um, so this is my question, really, and I talked about this in my essay. Two sisters. <laughs> you see, it's an odd subject. People, Is this a penthouse letter? You've got our attention. <laughs> it's an odd subject. People automatically think it's disgusting. But two sisters, they're in love. You're they off to a good start. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm hoping you'll talk about this and not also say it's disgusting. But um, two sisters, they can't produce children which are disabled, they're in love, and they're not harming anyone. So my question is, apart from saying it's disgusting, weird, and therefore wrong, can you give one good reason? as to why two people are in love and not harming people shouldn't be together. Just one good reason that's not, it's disgusting, just like people said against homosexuals. Okay. It, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very clever device to, to make it two sisters. I think that's brilliant. Uh, because, um, and I think that this, this beautifully points up the difference between absolutist morality, where you just say it's disgusting, the yuck factor, um, and um, utilitarian or consequentialist morality. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I can see no reason at all why, uh, why the, these two sisters shouldn't, shouldn't marry if they, if they want to. So, it's another or great if, or clip. I suppose if, yeah, no, I think, I think that, that stands, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's gonna be great on YouTube, Richard. <laughs> we um, could make it better by just agreeing with him. Well, I, uh, one, one thing I, I would add here is that disgust as a moral emotion is, is obviously this is part of our evolutionary inheritance, but it is a very bad machine for, for producing moral wisdom. And, and, and what is disgusting in one context or in one you know, cultural context is uh, often not in another. And I, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I think there is a, a truly universal way of solving the question of how to maximize human well-being. Uh, as it's, not, it's not even to say that there are, there's only one right answer, there, but there, there's certainly wrong answers. There can be many right answers, and there's certainly many wrong answers. And they're wrong not just for you and me and everyone in this room, they're wrong for everybody. You know, cutting the head off your child is a bad way to raise that child to be a, a, a functional adult. Uh, and so that's one wrong answer number one. Uh, but this, this issue of, of uh, incest, in, in this case, I mean, this is a thought experiment that, that the psychologist Jonathan Haidt has, has used to great effect to produce a 
phenomenon that he calls moral dumbfounding, where he'll ask, he'll, he'll, pr he'll produce an example like that, and he'll ask people whether it's right or wrong, and they, they'll have a very strong disgust based sense that it's wrong, but then when told to give a, a rationale for why it's wrong, they, they basically come up with a, this, this very lawyerly opinion that, that is just a, it's a kind of confabulation. You know, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really intersect with any kind of moral philosophy. Uh, I think the, the one, other, one other consequentialist point I, I, I would make is that uh, in the local case, it might inf well be not wrong for two people who can't have kids and can't suffer in any way to be you know, prosecuting their, their taboo love for one another. Uh, but there's, I think par part of the consequences are the, just what happens to society, what happens to other relationships, what happens, I mean, there's a, you're, you're in dialogue, you're not in a moral solitude, usually, with your behavior. And um, so, I mean, another example is, you know, why, when someone dies, why don't we just chuck their body in the garbage, right? I mean, so it's all the same to them. There, there's, you know, there's no one to suffer that desecration, but that the point of treating a dead body well is because of all the good it does for the living, right? The, the way it honors our relationship with the people we're, we, we still uh, love and, and, and have spent our lives connected to. So, some, and, and some, not just the people in their life, but that individual as well. This, this question's come up to me. Yeah. Sam and I advocate for very almost identical versions of consequentialism. Uh, if you live in a society where you know that there's a likelihood that your body's just going to be thrown in the trash or that your organs are going to be farmed out and this isn't what you want, you have a particular view, this diminishes the quality of your life while you're living. If you live in a society where you understand that we're going to respect the wishes of people after they're dead, this increases the, the, the well-being of your life while you're living. That is in, not inconsequential. That's something that you have to consider. It's yeah. not just about the other people in their life. It's about the quality of your life leading up to the, your death. If, if you were living in Logan's Run and you knew the secret, oh, sorry, spoiler, they, they're going to be killed. It, it would change how you lived those years prior to that. And that's, we, we tend to, uh, consequentialists come under fire um, by people who, from my point of view, seem to only be able to look at things myopically as, oh, this is how it affects me right now. And, and like in your example, I don't have any objection to your example, but I'm in agreement with Sam that there may be extenuating circumstances in the complexities of a society that might make it not a good idea. To and slippery slope arguments that can be perfect, perfectly good as well. I mean, yeah. The argument against eating human road kills um, would be um, a, a, where, where there's nobody to mourn them. Um, there's probably an argument about against using the phrase even, I would think. That, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, I mean, uh, slip, slippery slope, we have a very good taboo against, against, against cannibalism. Yeah. In the case of the taboo against incest, I, I was about to say, I remember I stopped myself, maybe there's a slippery slope, but I can't actually think of it in that case. Um, I can't think of this case of two sisters marrying what the slippery slope would look like. I think Matt just gave it. If, if behind every closed door there might be two sisters having sex, that would diminish our quality of life while alive. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's what I said, but I'll go with it. There, 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 is, a, there is a slippery slope. I mean, if you allow two sisters, then we you kind of have, then you get mother and son arguing for it, and of course that's not right. Sure, yeah. but we're not going to spend the rest of the night going down that slippery slope. I, <laughs> I thank you for your question. Thank you. And I want to move over to the side. Thanks for waiting while we talked about all kinds of stuff. Good, Good evening. Um, paraphrasing uh, Lawrence Krauss, science is changing the playing field in a way which makes people uncomfortable. And you gentlemen are three prime examples of this ever accelerating trend. So Richard Dawkins says we are survival machines meant to propagate uh, genes in the gene pool. Um, Sam Harris says there's the self is an illusion and there might not be free will. And Matt Delahunty says there's no God, the um, universe doesn't have, the, have a purpose and doesn't owe you anything. How do we address this discomfort and nihilistic views that some people might have when transitioning out of religions or dogma, and maybe you have sometimes these this thoughts, and how do you fend them off? Thank you. I'm glad you asked this. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how well you paraphrase any of the three of us, because we're all going to nitpick this, but this, 
this issue of meaning was something that we talked about that we wanted to address tonight, issues about death and, and nihilism and the fears of, oh my gosh, you, you are insignificant to the universe. How can we better deal with those? Well, we might, might have slightly different answers to this, but I, I think it's worth acknowledging that, that it really is a problem. I, I mean, the way, the way I view secularism, it, it, secularism and, and even atheism specifically, these are not answers to the problem of living a good life. And, and, that, and that is a problem every one of us wake up in the morning trying to solve. You, 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 have to, uh, you have to find some game to play in this life that is satisfying. And it's a genuine question, you know, how to, how to get what you want out of life. And there's a deeper question of, about, about whether or not you want the right things. Right? Is there a deeper game to be playing that you're not aware of or you haven't learned how to play? Uh, and I think, there, I think there are right answers to those questions. There, there, it's possible to not know what you're missing. It's possible that you are in a circumstance where your life could be much better than it is, but it's not going to be that way because you're tending to live as you did yesterday. And the problem with secularism and atheism and even humanism is that these really aren't answers to that question. These are just ways of clearing away the bad answers offered by religion. And the, 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 the religious answers are bad for many reasons, but they're, but they're bad because in, in, in their substantive particulars, they're, they're almost certainly untrue, but they're also there's a, there's a, a diversity of religious answers which are, are in zero-sum contest with all others, and therefore they're divisive, and they're, they you know, amplify the tribalism we see in the world. So uh, this problem of how to live a good life is a real one, and into that space cleared by secularism and atheism and, and the, the, the criticism of ancient bad ideas has to come something. And for, for some people it's science, for some people it's art, for some people it's, it's uh, some secular version of, of you know, what I've in terror and, and shame and in scare quotes called spirituality. Uh, but the, you need something, and most people on earth are living as though there's, there's um, either there's no basis to find something apart from religion, uh, or having lost religion, they're, they're living as though the answer is just to be eating a little less sugar than the average person your age, and watching a little less pornography than the average person your age, and trying to be responsible and well-educated, and there's, there is nothing sacred or profound left. Uh, and I think that's, that is a real deficit of, of the secular conversation, and I think we need, we need a, a secular version of profundity that, uh, again, this is a place where we may, may differ. I, th I don't think science and art and fun fully capture what we want in life. There's something else. The particular, the particular example of the question that threw at me was my view that we are survival machines for our, for our genes, which many people think is bleak, and Sam's view that we have no free will is, is, is bleak. I think there's a nobility in that bleakness. Uh, I, I'm inclined to say, if somebody says to me, oh, well, somebody did say to me, actually, after the Selfish Gene was published, um, that he couldn't sleep for three nights uh, after, after he read it. Um, and uh, another man told me that, uh, was a Canadian professor said that uh, a young woman student of his came in to him in tears having read the Selfish Gene because it made her feel that her life was, was meaningless. Um, I mean, my inclination there is to say, well, tough. Um, <laughs> maybe your life... Maybe your life is meaningless, but... <laughs> you need to change the way you look at your life, because, the, because what's true can't be changed. I'm reminded of the 18th century wit, I forget who it was, who a, a lady said, I accept the universe, and he said, by gad, she'd better. That was one of my sort of first 
first reaction, but actually accepting the universe, accepting the truth of the universe, accepting the truth about life, bleak as it may be, there is a nobility. You, you stand up and face into the keen wind of the truth, and I think that is a, a noble and a, an actually aesthetically pleasing thing to do anyway. So I don't want to hide from the truth. I think that the, that the truth can be hard, but there is nobility in accepting it. And I think Darwin, I mean, that's somewhat the meaning of Darwin's famous closing words of the origin of species. Um, there is a grandeur in this view of life. Uh, so I think that, that maybe I differ slightly from Sam on, the, on that. Oh. Yeah. I, well, I, I, would, I would just add that there's nothing unscientific in what I would propose no. we need to honor the, no, the profundity true. of our circumstance. Sure. I, I, it's not that you have to believe anything on insufficient no, evidence, yeah. but I just feel like there, there's more to, to a rich human experience than merely not being wrong. Of course. Or, not, or, or having correct you know, propositional knowledge of the world. And I, I know, obviously, you share that view. And it may not be one answer for everybody. I, I tend to look at it, by the way, as uh, religions, I think, by and large, have come from flawed thinking trying to answer the questions about reality, including about our fears and death and life and what's, what's the meaning and purpose. And because of this, and because they become so pervasive, they have absolutely infused every conversation even if you're not a religious individual you're surrounded by people and and they've passed on as memes to, to address oh well you can't have meaning unless it's this type of meaning that is encapsulated within religion when there may be other meaning that's valuable oh, we we by by poisoning the well with religious ideas of the way things ought to be it it seems to increase this frustration when we find out things don't work the way religion thinks they ought to be. And it's the example I've heard somebody say once that um, religion poisons you and then offers you the cure. And I, I changed that to say that religion convinces you you're poisoned when you're not and then offers you the homeopathic remedy. <laughs> and instead of going down that route, it's going to be difficult to take people who have had these ideas that everything, where the, the entire conversation has been colored by religious claims about the way things ought to be, uh, it's going to take work. And that's why I hear from people who've been atheists for 50 years and wake up with nightmares of hell or frustrations about nihilism. And I would say, I'm sure we'll get into this at some point, maybe not tonight, but uh, Dennett would point out that the conversations around free will have been similarly poisoned by the things that we want about free will, uh, that we want to have moral responsibility. And I don't, I don't think that free will in any libertarian sense is required for that in the first place, nor do I think it exists. So I'm, I'm kind of in the middle ground on that, and I don't want to go down that path since we all answered this one, but we'll... Yes, sir. Hi, um, this is a question for Sam. You are all talking earlier about authority in science and on social media, who to trust. Um, I was wondering who you thought had more authority in general when it came to metaphysics, an expert scientist or an expert philosopher? Um, well, it's, it depends what you mean by metaphysics. People use this word in a wide variety of ways. Can you, can you um, unpack that? I guess the reflection on physics as a whole. So would, would someone who had first-hand experience with experiments and stuff as a physicist have some sort of greater authority in that regard? Well, it's not really a matter of uh, granting authority to any one discipline over another, any, or one person over another in, in any kind of generic sense. I mean, if, uh, the person who has the most authority for me is the person who's making sense at that moment. You know, so, so in the moment, the, the, even the greatest authority stops making sense, right? He, he or she's got about two sentences to solve that problem before my faith in their view of, of, of at least that topic begins to erode. So I mean, you're sort of as good as your last sentence in this game. Uh, and that's, and that's, a, um, that's what makes it thrilling to actually have public conversations with people 
who are smart and uh, who, who have a lot of knowledge to bring to bear on, on a topic. Um, as far as the contributions of philosophy, I, I'm not somebody, I mean, I said something that was fairly, that was read as fairly denigrating of philosophy in the moral landscape, but it actually I, it was misinterpreted and uh, I'm a huge uh, fan of philosophy. I don't think philosophy is going away and insofar as we're making an effort to resolve conceptual confusion in our science, you know, that, 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 that's always going to be the work of philosophy, whether it's done by scientists or philosophers in each mo moment. And, uh, you know, metaphysics in the, in the philosophical sense is, is often working in the background of any kind of uh, uh, assertion about our beliefs being in, in register with reality when we're, when we're doing science. So I mean, the, the, the work of a philosopher is, is always there to be done. Point, ooh, I lost my mic there. Yeah. I wanted to point out we've got about 15 minutes of questioning left, and as a reminder, there'll be book signing up there for those people who are part of that. But uh, so I will do my part to to keep my answers uh, maybe even non-existent, but at least brief, and and we'll try and do the same by keeping questions short so we can get to as many people as possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an easy one. I just wanted to bring up the animal issue. I'm not like a militant vegan or anything, but. Um, Richard and Sam, you've both interviewed Peter Singer, who's somebody who intuitively I sort of not sure about, and then I find myself really unable to sort of disprove or uh, things which he say seem quite logically sort of consistent. And I was just wondering, talking about brick walls earlier, uh, are we all brick walls on this topic? Why are we sort of, why is society so stuck and where do you see it sort of going forward from here on this issue? Specifically on the food issue or? Um, well, this particular question comes from an argument I had over foie gras, which I guess is oh, quite yeah. well, an extreme are, case. You are a hard case. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's a continuum, I guess. But yeah, um, yeah on, on the, the food, go on, whatever you want. Right. Surprise me. You, 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 weren't, <laughs> you weren't eating that foie gras with Nazis, were you? <laughs> uh, well, Singer, I, I, Singer is can make you very uncomfortable because his arguments uh, take you to an extreme point of, of criticism with respect to your own daily ethics, uh, and yet it's hard to find fault with them. I, I think his, his shallow pond argument is among the best in, in moral philosophy, and I don't think there is an adequate response to it. This doesn't relate to the, the issue of food. Uh, it's just for those of you who don't know the shallow pond argument, it's worth a moment. The singer asked us to contemplate uh, what it would be like to, let's say, I told you now, I came to this auditorium and on the way I passed a, a small child drowning in a shallow pond, uh, but I was late so I just left her there to drown. Uh, and actually my, my most important concern is I didn't want to get my shoes wet. You know, they cost you know, a couple of hundred dollars and you know, I, I, I you know, this seems a shame to waste a pair of good shoes. Uh, now, you would rightly view me as a moral monster for, for having that sort of inner life. Uh, and yet, if I told you I received an appeal from UNICEF or some valid charity, which said, if, you know, if only you gave us $200, you could save uh, a human life, just like this one. And, and they, they even provided a photo of a child. Uh, and I told you that, you know, I, I get those appeals all the time, and I, you know, I, I sometimes send money, but sometimes I don't, and I happen to throw this one away. You, you, that's, a, that's sort of the common experience of humanity at this point. We're all that moral monster. We know there's something we could do to save a life that we didn't do today, because the mechanism is there to do it. And, and Singer asks us to square that, that um, seeming paradox, and it's, it's only, uh, the, the paradox is only reduced to, Infinitesimal, infinitesimally when you, when you add things like, well, this is, this is a life that's near to you versus one that's far away. Um, I, I think the, the, the future for truly, a truly moral species is in getting, taking more and more of Singer's arguments on board institutionally, where we are, we are allocating resources in a way that could withstand that kind of analysis, and we're doing it, and we're not requiring each of us to be a saint moment to moment, but we're just requiring that, that our systems function with, with that degree of moral wisdom. And I think we're, we're a, a far away from doing that, but I, that, 
that is the goal. So I, I think he's, he's ultimately right on, on most of those points. Yes, I, I think Peter Singer is a very good example of philosophy at, at its best. And, and um, as Sam says, it's extremely difficult to fault his arguments. They're immensely persuasive. Um, I'm not quite sure why you need to be a philosopher. You just need to be a clear thinker. I mean, you, don't need to, you don't need to actually have read a lot of the history of philosophy, I think, to be able to come up with arguments as he does. Um, question I asked mostly about the animal issue, and um, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with trying to be more vegetarian than I was, and, I'm, and at, at home I'm pretty much entirely vegetarian now. Uh, I tend not to be vegetarian in, when I go out to dinner with other people. So it, it's a sort of step in the right direction, but it's not a big, big enough step. Um, I think I'd like everybody to be vegetarian. Then, then great chefs would start creating dishes that are less boring. <laughs> but I, but I, 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 do feel a, 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 I do feel a moral guilt about uh, humanity, about, about myself. And I feel it particularly when I see um, those lorries with going off to the slaughterhouse with eyes peering through those little slats and um, animals uh, being crowded and there in might, there. might be a technological fix for that, too. And there's this movement now called, it was called cultured meat, it's now called clean meat. And there's some startups in the US, maybe there are in the UK, that are trying to, to grow actual animal protein well, that would be in wonderful. a bat, with yes. a, you know, not associated um, with that animal. That would be wonderful. And by the way, that's, that could re we could revert to an earlier discussion about the, the yuck factor. There's no reason at all, of course, why you shouldn't have tissue culture of human uh, meat. Um, another and, and point that, that would, again, that would be we will see on YouTube. So instead of human roadkill, it's human lab kill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, human and that's lab just lab the kill. kind Although, of question that moral philosophers like to deal with, and, and rightly so. Yeah. so. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts about the um, distinction between a set of ideas and the uh, people who subscribe to them. Because I know that when you're criticizing a set of ideas, you could be called stuff like uh, gross or racist. But um, the standard response seems to be that, oh, I'm not criticizing people. I'm criticizing the ideas. But I think that while it's true to some extent, it's also a bit of a cop out. Because if a set of ideas is truly horrible, then the person subscribing to those would by consequence be a, a horrible individual and well no uh, no i mean not because necessarily look, think of what happens when someone actually changes their view i mean there there are yeah, people I, who I, were i don't mean that uh, it's not uh, open to change but um, well i i was just wanting to hear your thoughts about that distinction and the uh, controversy surrounding it i but, tend to try not to assess people in that sense of you're a good person you're a bad person and uh, instead, it's you're advocating for good things or you're advocating for bad things rather than trying to sum up. I don't, even in the heated discussions or something, you might say, oh, you're an idiot or that's moronic or whatever else. And, and I've done it. I've done it, uh, surprise, uh, on the show. But it, it is still a give up move. It's probably born more of frustration. I've always advocated for addressing ideas instead of the people. I try to avoid summarizing that. I'm going to fail. But I, as Sam was interjecting, the fact that somebody is currently advocating for bad ideas, that alone isn't enough for me to determine the content of their character. I can only address the content of those ideas and say, because if you change their mind, and their mind is changed perhaps relatively quickly, as some of us changed our minds, that tells you far more about the actual content of their character. The fact that we, there are people with bad ideas uh, is independent of, of the, you know, an assessment of their whole character. But listening to the question, I think what lay behind the question was, was the very frequent occasions when criticizing Islam is taken as criticism of individual Muslims. I think that's where it's totally different from what you've been talking about, Matt, because there, what I would say to that is that individual Muslims are usually the, the most severely ma maltreated victims of Islam. Mm -hmm. And so we're not, we're not talking about whether we, uh, we should um, 
respect people who have bad ideas. We're, we're talking about people who have, who are the victims of bad ideas, um, and who uh, are, are not necessarily. I mean, they may propound them in a, in, in a certain way, but but I, I think that's what lay behind the the, the questioner. Yeah, and more generally, I, I think there's this confusion between criticizing the ideas and hating groups of people for reasons of racism or xenophobia or some other animus. And I mean, this is this so clearly doesn't map on to what real critics of Islam are doing. I mean, real critics of Islam are 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 trying to help Muslim apostates, right, who share all of the racial and ethnic and and national backgrounds of their former co-religionists. Uh, so if, you, if you're, if you're uh, prejudiced against Arabs or Pakistanis, well then, you know, it's kind of strange behavior to be becoming best friends with, with Pakistani or, or Arab ex-Muslims, right? Um, and in, in terms of just how fully people can redeem themselves, I, I think you, it's just, we, we shouldn't undersell this. Majid Nawaz, was, was, he was an Islamist Right, and he's one of the, the the greatest people I know now, and yet he was he can he can point to a a moment on the calendar where his mind changed, you know, and and, and as an Islamist, I couldn't really imagine collaborating with him nor nor him with me, I'm sure, but but he's an absolutely fantastic person and a friend, and we sort of stumbled into a friendship friendship by by virtue of first meeting under conditions that were that seemed quite hostile to conversation. So this really can, you can really fully converge with someone who at one point you would have totally disagreed with. I endorse that. Majid Nawaz, I think, is a, is a real hero. Oh, yeah. And I want to say there's, a, there's at least a chance that your question is the last one not to put any pressure on you. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a question for anyone to jump in on, um, and it's basically revolving around, um, around comedy. A lot of um, comedians say that like, the reason that jokes are funny is because they have like, at least an element of truth to them. So I want to ask what you all think of um, the role of ridicule and satire in changing people's minds. I think ridicule and satire is great, and, and, and I, I think, it, I think it's, our, it's our greatest weapon uh, against, against religion. You, I mean, there's so much food for ridicule, there's so much opportunity. Uh, it, it kind of touches on the last question about the difference between ridiculing individuals and ridiculing ideas. Exactly. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. It, and if an idea is ridiculous, it's deserving of ridicule by definition of uh, the, the absurdness of it. But it, it values, it, it, it atta attacks the issue in a way that may be safer than a straightforward, oh, this is wrong and here's why. It may not only be more effective, but it may be safer because we can laugh at stuff. We can laugh at, you know, transubstantiation or, you know, when Elvis died for my sins, he stayed dead type of things. The, the, the idea is, are, are fi I'm fine with ridiculing. I love it. I, I love satire and all that. I don't know that it's the starting point. But I also don't know that it's not the starting point. We had in the secular and atheist community for years, and probably still, disagreements over whether there should be firebrands or diplomats. And then it was, you started labeling who's a firebrand and who's a diplomat. Well, I'm both, depending on the, in, the situation and who I'm talking to, and I think that we need as many different honest avenues of attack um, as we can find, because people believe for different reasons, and they're going to stop believing for different reasons. There are people who, I'm, I'm never going to convince that Richard's going to convince. There's people who neither one of us are going to convince um, that Ricky Gervais is going to convince with a joke. Why not? What, what's the problem with having multiple paths of attack instead of saying, ah, well, you firebrands, you're, you're the bad atheists, or you diplomats, you're the, you know, the conformists, the, 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 or the, the peacemakers, you're letting them get away with the softer version of their religion. I think that's a time. 
Uh, one more. I can't see that. We'll do one more on that side really quick. Or is it? So first of all, um, all the people behind me, we're, we're at a celebration of reason. They believe in miracles. Um, <laughs> Sam, um, I'm a fan of yours. I've, uh, I'm one of the small percentage of people that uh, pays to enjoy your podcast. And uh, I, even, uh, I even tweeted you to invite you out to dinner in London. You spoke before about the two possible tracks in terms of influencing um, uh, a change of Islam reform or just abandon it. Surely you, you might be missing a trick, which is that these 1.6 billion people, um, their religion is wrapped up in their culture, in their identity, in who they, who they are, their food, their communities. Uh, their values or their perceived perception of those things mm -hmm. and surely and, and, and it plays into the question that before we stood here before me when when we are engaging whether it's you know on YouTube or, or on a conversation with, with somebody who professes to belong to that community whatever their beliefs we need to be sensitive to the way they, they perceive themselves so for example a Muslim person considers themselves may consider themselves to be a Muslim in this, in, and, and it, there's nothing they can do about it. They were born that way, in the same way as I was born as a Caucasian. Um, and, and doesn't that come back into that question about um, people feeling pers it's personal against them when you attack their religion or their belief or their, their lifestyle? Well, it's understandable that people would feel that way. I mean, that's, so that's the first concession. Yes, it, attacking Islam in a very abbreviated form without a lot of context or without an ability to to, to um, explain the issue that can be expected to offend some number of, of Muslims, no doubt, but uh, we're talking about a, lo a longer conversation that, that the culture has to have with itself and only uh, in the best case the people in the culture can have that conversation. I think only they can have it effectively, ultimately, for, for reasons that you allude to. But there's nothing, the, 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 the worst beliefs can be dissected out of any religion, or they can be just uh, ignored. I mean, they don't even have to be edited out of the books, necessarily, although that would, that would be convenient. Uh, and it is a problem that they're not edited. It's a problem that there's a tradition that, w that we can't edit these books because they're a matter of revelation, because then fundamentalism becomes kind of like a, you know, the reboot procedure on, the, on culture. If you just put people on an island with a copy of the Quran, the, the Islam they will very likely create out of assiduous study of that text will be the, uh, the sort that, that we should be most apt to criticize. Uh, so it's, it's a problem that you can't battlerize scripture. But no, when you look at the, the life of an ex-Muslim who still has a, is, is very much in the community, who has a relationships with current Muslims and speaks the language and loves the food and loves the, the architecture, and I mean, that's their world, uh, that's, the, that's the front line of this conversation. And, that's, and that clearly is, that's a change that's, happening and, and can happen. And, and then there's, uh, again, the, the other track, which is the, the Muslim reformer, the, the, the person who hasn't disavowed the faith necessarily, but for whom, this is a person for whom it's absolutely clear that we don't want to live in a world where you cut the hands off of thieves, right, or uh, uh, kill apostates, or even, even more edgier still, you want to live in a world where women are the political equals of men, though you can find precious little reason to do that on the basis of a study of the Quran and the Hadith. Um, and that, you know, even in Saudi Arabia, some, some people just woke up to a world where women can now drive. You know, so, I mean, so the change is conceivable, and once that change happens, it's, it's harder to roll it back, I think. And so I, I think I wouldn't underestimate how much progress people can make within the culture, and you also shouldn't underestimate the effect of people like ourselves uh, outside the culture making the, the offensive noises we make, because I mean, when I was with Majid in Australia at a, at a book signing, uh, someone came up to me and said, listen, I, I just want you to know, I'm, I've, I've come like, straight from Pakistan, I was in a, an absolutely fundamentalist context, all my friends and family are, are Islamists, if not jihadists, and yet your YouTube videos reached me. 
And I, I, sell that, I say that not to congratulate myself, I'm just saying that, that I, I was bowled over by that. It never for a moment seemed possible to me that that would, would happen or have any positive effect, really, in, in that context, and yet it does, and if uh, Majid wants to attest to that somewhere, he, he, he can. Yeah. Can I can I put in a can I put in a little boast as as well? Um, there is there is no official Arabic translation of the God delusion. There is an illicit, uh, bootlegged mm. PDF uh, of the God delusion in Arabic, which has been downloaded ten million times. Yeah. And right. and a third, of, a third of those in Saudi Arabia. Mm. On, uh, on that note, my apologies to the people standing in line. I'm told there's a young man about five up that line that we're just going to move to the front and give to the final question to. Mm. Hello? Hi. Hi. There's one way to find out if I sound like a mouse on helium. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to state that I am a member of the ACA, so curtsy. <laughs> but my question for you is, I've had Christian prayers come into my school. I've had um, Christian priests and even a Christian pop group come into my school. I'm wondering what you would think if I were to say that maybe a Muslim pop group were to come in my school. What do you think that teachers and everybody else in the school would be supportive of that, or would they see it differently from anything else? Mm. I, I don't really understand. So, uh, I, I should, I'm probably the one least qualified to answer this, because in, in the UK, they don't have the same type of church state separation that we have in the US. And it's been very effective because when the Christian groups come into schools to do things that they ought not be doing but nobody really cares about because we're just going to go along with it because our culture, one of the most effective uh, counters to that has been Satanists. <laughs> Satanists have been coming into the United States, schools in the United States saying, hey, if the Christian groups can do it, we can do it too. And they put out these awesome coloring books that have nice moral messages in them. And as soon as they start handing out their stuff, all of a sudden the Christian propaganda just vanishes. There's a difference with the issue of potentially having a state religion as to whether or not that same sort of tactic could exist here. Um, but it might. I don't know. I can't tell you how the teachers would react, but I'd encourage you to give it a go. <laughs> We're spreading Satanism to the youth now, apparently. <laughs> Considering the other things we spread tonight, yeah. Satanism's yeah. pretty up there. First, I, I, let me just express how amazed I am that, that you are here and that you asked a question that well. It gives me yeah, yeah. hope for the future. Yeah. And your, your parents should be great. Well done. Thank you, that means a lot to me. I'm on top of the world, Ma. <laughs> All right. If there's nothing more to add, is anybody, you, did you guys have a closing statement for the crowd that you wanted to make? Nope. <laughs> Been a great thank, crowd. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you guys so much. There'll be book signing up there. Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. <laughs>